available. I think if you actually go uh, to the Christ Life website, ChristLifeMen.org, you can click on the link uh, to watch some of the sessions uh, that are there. Amen. And so, ladies, if you want to take every opportunity, I encourage you to do so. Amen. All right, we're going to go into our announcements here. And uh, before we turn it over to the pastor for the message this morning, again, I want to thank everybody for being here. Thank you for joining uh, on the Internet for our services here this morning. Uh, just uh, it says on the back of our bulletin here, it says, Today, let's just praise the Lord. Amen. I want to praise God in everything yes. and all things give thanks and all our ways acknowledge him. Praise God. Well, next Sunday is Palm Sunday. Amen. Palm Sunday, the 28th. So just wanted to note that. And then uh, coming up the following weekend for Easter, Resurrection Sunday, uh, we will not have evening service. So on Friday night, April the 2nd, we're going to have Good Friday service. That'll be here in the sanctuary at 7 o'clock. Now, that's also the same time we have RU, which we're still going to go on forward with. So, folks, uh, if you come for RU, if you're planning on being here for RU, we're going to gather in the back in the fellowship hall. Everybody else, if you're coming for Good Friday service, just come on in here in the sanctuary as you normally would. And that will be in lieu of our evening service on Sunday evening. So, so for a Good Friday service on April the 2nd at 7. And then Sunday morning, Resurrection Sunday, we'll have regular service here in the church and almost Sunday school. Uh, but then we will not have any evening service at 7 o'clock on Sunday the 4th. Okay? Now, one of the things that we do like to do is to decorate, uh, as we do with the poinsettias for Christmas. We do the same with tulips for Resurrection Sunday. And so there on your bulletin, it says, if you're interested in placing a tulip for Easter Sunday, uh, you can see Cindy or place an order in the offering plate with your name and number, or there's a sign-up sheet in the foyer. Okay, so you can just put your name down, the number of tulips. We'll do one group order, and you can pay for those, however many that you would like to get uh, after the fact, and they'll be... Uh, the one up here that we'll be able to have through Resurrection Sunday, and then afterwards folks can take those home, as many as you'd like to buy. So if you'd like, you know, one or two or however many you'd like, they'll just sit up here to be able to, uh, to be able to enjoy that time in the season. And then, of course, after Resurrection Sunday service, folks will take those home. So if you have any questions about purchasing the tulips, uh, just see Cindy. She'll be glad to help you out. Uh, May 8th is the Tender Care Walk for Life, and you can be a walker or a sponsor. I'd encourage folks to get involved with that. Uh, it is a virtual walk, as they had to do last year, of course, because of the pandemic. Have everybody gathered together wasn't uh, appropriate. It still isn't, but we want to continue to raise money for that organization. If you're not uh, sure about what Tender Care is or what they do, you can check out their website, tendercare.org. Uh, you can speak to Cindy or Linda or Diane or Pam or if anybody else is involved. I apologize I didn't mention your name, uh, but it's a great, great ministry, amen, to give uh, pregnancy consultation services to women, and not only uh, while they're pregnant, but also if they're thinking of getting pregnant or circumstances after they have the baby, diapers and, and formula and, and uh, everything that they can do to facilitate the life of that child to meet the emotional support, the financial support, all of those things that folks are going to need to raise that child. Amen. And so we just really praise God for that ministry. And so if you want to get involved with that, uh, anybody can be a walker, anybody can be a sponsor. Amen. So I'd encourage you to do one or the other. Amen. If you're not going to participate in the walk to gather the money, I'd encourage you to sponsor. Amen. And take the opportunity to be able to bless that program. All right. Any other questions, announcements before we go ahead and get into our message this morning? All right. Pastor Bob, if you would, please. All right. Well, let's go to the Lord in prayer. We'll get into the Word of God. Dear Heavenly Father, we humbly come before you this morning. Lord, we thank you for the way in which you met with the ladies at the prayer advance. I thank you, Lord, for their testimonies that we heard here this morning. And Lord, I ask that you would just continue to work in their life and in our lives, dear God, to draw us ever closer to yourself. Please, Father, we need you desperately. We need you now more than any time before. And I pray you would come and invade our hearts and our minds and saturate us with the Holy Ghost and with power, Father. Thank you, God, that you're a God answering prayer and that there's nothing too difficult for you. I lift up Cindy before you, God, Cindy Heller, who is dealing with a, a nerve, a pinched nerve uh, in her neck, God, that they, they're talking about surgery. But Lord, we are coming before the great physician, and we are asking for a supernatural healing that there would not have to be a surgery, God. So I'm praying, Lord, for a special measure of your grace and you're working to bring healing to her body. I pray for the multitude of other souls within our building, Lord, within our church family here that are suffering with all sorts of afflictions, dear God, that you would bring health and healing to the body. I pray for 
comfort to the hearts of all those that have loved ones that have passed away, Lord, and have gone on to glory. Where hearts are heavy, God, and we just pray that you would just touch our hearts in a special way, uh, lift the discouragement that we feel, and help us, God, to be filled with joy in your love. Father, be with me now. Speak through me for your glory and honor. In Jesus' most precious and holy name I pray, amen. All right, all right. So, uh, oh, I got to do this, right? Forgot. I believe that this is the Word of God. I believe this is the Word of God. I believe every word of God is true. Amen. I'd like to emphasize that with me. Amen. Why? Because it's impossible for God to lie. Amen. Amen. Now we're ready to turn to the book of the Bible. Where's Shay? We're going to turn to the book of the Bible that tells us who's responsible to make the coffee. Amen. Hebrews. Amen. So, so turn to Hebrews chapter 2. You guys are saying, that pastor's a real comedian today. He, he better not leave his job as a preacher. <laughs> All right, Hebrews chapter 2. Now, uh, a year ago, a year ago, there was nobody in this auditorium right now. The whole COVID thing had started and we had canceled services. And it was a unique experience for us. In fact, at that time, there was a tripod with a cell, a cell phone attached to it with, a, with a, a wooden clamp. And we were trying our best to broadcast messages. And now we're uptown, we got a camera. <laughs> but, uh, but it was a new experience. And it was waters that we weren't too sure of. But the only thing that we knew for sure is that even if we couldn't meet together, we still needed the messages to go out. As COVID would unfold, many souls would lose their life. Some people would end up in a Christless eternity, meaning they died and went to a very real hell and are still there right now, suffering. Others died and they went to heaven to be with the Lord. In fact, during this time period, not because of COVID, amen, not because of COVID, but we had a number of people pass away in our church. All of them are in glory right now, worshiping God. Now the thing to get to that point is you have to pass through death. And death can be intimidating. And death can be fearful, even for the believer. But yet we're going to read a couple of passages of Scripture here this morning where God tells us that we shouldn't fear death. And I want to try to just answer the question, why do people feel death, fear death? Why do even Christians who know the truth sometimes fear death? And so in Hebrews chapter 2, in verse number 14, the Word of God says, For as much then as the children are partakers of flesh and blood, he also himself likewise took part of the same. Now, what he's talking about there is Jesus having the same flesh and blood body that you and I have, all right? That you and I have. There were a lot of uh, bad teaching at the time that Hebrews was read, written, and then even after that, where people were denying that Jesus was actually in a body like ours and all this and that. No, Jesus is God in human flesh, and His human flesh was just like our human flesh. He wasn't sinful. He didn't have a sin nature. He never sinned. But His flesh was the same as our flesh. Now, He had to be in this human flesh for a specific purpose. He has to be in this flesh for a specific purpose. He says, for as much then as the children are partakers of flesh and blood, he also himself likewise took part of the same, that through death he might destroy him that had the power of death, that is the devil. So he has to put on human flesh 
for the purpose of experiencing death for us. He has to go to the cross. Remember John the Baptist and, and uh, uh, the Gospel of John, chapter 1, verse 29. And John's job was simply to point people to Jesus. Our job today is the same thing. Point people to Jesus. And there's a, a ver- and in the Gospel of John, chapter 1 and verse 29, John says, Behold, in other words, look, look at over there, look at this individual. Behold, the Lamb of God. Lamb speaks of sacrifice. They knew, those Jews knew that lambs had to be sacrificed for sin, to cover sin. But John said something unique. John said, Behold, the Lamb of God that taketh away the sin of the world. Amen? In the Old Testament covenant, the blood of bulls and goats could only cover sin. Under the New Covenant, the sacrifice of Jesus Christ, it does not just cover my sin, it removes it. It separates my sin from me. Amen? But in order for Him to do that, He has to suffer death on the cross. He has to pay the penalty for my sin. He has to be punished in place of me. All of God's wrath is being poured out upon Jesus. Amen? So He puts on human flesh so that He could defeat the enemy. It said there again in verse 14, it says that through death He might destroy him that had the power of death, that is the devil. It's important for you to understand that at the cross, the devil was absolutely destroyed. Absolutely. Now, he is still wandering around. He's still roaming. He's still causing problems. He's still trying to mess up your plans. He's still trying to figure out a way to undo what was done at the cross, but he can't do it. He's a defeated foe, amen? And someday, Jesus is going to come back and he's going to say, that's it. I have the title deed for this earth. You're gone. And cast them to the, to the bottomless pit. Amen? That is going to happen. And if the rapture happens tonight, it'll happen seven years from tonight. Amen? He'll grab that old rascal and cast him. Our enemy has been defeated and we need to realize that our enemy is defeated. Now, one of the tools that the devil uses brilliantly is the tool of fear. Because he knows that if he can get you to fear, he can paralyze you. He can stifle you. He can keep you from doing what you need to do. And so there's a lot of different fears that people have, but probably one of the greatest fears that people have is the fear of death. Now notice what it says in verse 15. So so verse 14 ends by, uh, the last part of verse 14 ends uh, with saying, Uh, that through death he might destroy him that had the power of death, that is the devil, and deliver them, deliver them, who through fear of death were all their lifetime subject to bondage. See, that's what fear does. It brings you into bondage. And if you're afraid of death, if you're afraid of dying, you're going to be in bondage. Folks, we're living in a time, and I don't want to, you know, talk crazily, But I am going to talk honestly with you. You have to get overcome. If you have a fear of death, you've got to overcome that because we are on the precipice of being in a nation that never before has persecuted Christians but is on the verge of full-scale persecution. You need to be listening close to what is being said in the media. Amen? It is not a coincidence that when this fella shot up that, that pornography place and killed those uh, women, now I'm not, he should have never done that. That was wrong. Amen? Uh, everybody agrees that was wrong. But the media made sure that you understood that he was a conservative Baptist. And that the president then makes a speech that all the hate rhetoric has to stop. He blames it on President Trump for saying the China virus, and then by extension, he blames it on us. In fact, one reporter went so far as to say 
that the boy admitted to being a sect addict and the pastor did not preach or teach properly about sexual relationships. Now, that reporter meant this, is that we're to go light and say, oh, it's all right for you to do whatever you want. You can be a homosexual, you can be a transgender, it is all fine. That's a bunch of baloney. God has set a standard, and men of God need to preach that standard from the pulpit or get out of the pulpit. Amen? No playing games. But when you start connecting these dots, and you have the president saying, we cannot be a nation that tolerates hate. First of all, let me enlighten the president. Ever since Adam and Eve have sinned, Hate has been a part of this world because it's part of the sin nature. I want to tell you this also. The president is not going to eradicate hatred. Amen? It's been a long, from when Cain killed Abel, there's been hatred. And because it's a problem of the heart, you're not going to make some laws that somehow you're going to eradicate 6,000 years of human uh, hatred. It is not going to happen. Amen? That doesn't mean that we don't try to be better human beings and respect one another, but we've got to understand we're not going to annihilate it. His problem is he hates just as much as that boy hates, except for his hatred is toward us, Bible believers, people that preach and teach the Word of God. I am telling you that Biden and Harris hate you. They hate me. Amen? And they don't want to do nothing more but to silence us any way they can. What does all that mean? It means that we are on the verge of a great collapse, of a great persecution coming to the people of God. And if you haven't been paying attention through the COVID virus, they have been silencing preachers, fining preachers, threatening to throw preachers in jail and many different states, not just California, and the numbers are extremely high, though they're not publicized, of preachers that have been threatened. Now, what does all this mean? That means that if you have a fear of death, you're not going to stand up for what is right. Amen? You know, why didn't people come to church when we begin to open the doors again and still haven't returned to church? A fear of death. They're afraid to die. And they're Christians. They're Christians, but they're not in the house of God worshiping together with us because they're afraid to die. And now you say, well, Pastor, you're not making friends. I'm not about making friends. I'm about truth, amen? I'm about either this book is real, God is real, heaven is real, and our, our, our business of being alive is so important that we do not have the time to run and hide. We have to be verbal about everything that's going on. Everything with the vaccine, with all of this stuff. I, I, I mean, but this is what's going to happen. They're not going to take it lying down. They are going to threaten you. And if you're fearful of your life, you are not going to stand. Right? You're not going to stand. I like what one preacher said about the COVID vi virus concerning uh, Christians in America. He said it was God's test of the Christian character. Amen. I said, wow, talk about hitting the nail on the head there. God's test of the Christian character. Folks, we need to be about the master's business no matter what it costs. And there's too many of our brothers and sisters in Christ around this globe that have suffered violence, that have suffered bloodshed, that have suffered for the simple purpose of believing in Jesus Christ. Why we in America let the slightest little thing cause us to cut and run. Well, the governor says you can't worship. The governor says you can't sing in your services. That's what they're doing in California. They told them you can come to church, but you can't sing. You know what that reminds me of? Reminds me of Exodus. Reminds me of Pharaoh. Oh, Moses, you can go in the wilderness and offer your sacrifice, but you've got to leave your young ones behind. Remember? 
All these conditions Pharaoh was putting on him. Pharaoh's a picture of the devil. Egypt's a picture of the world. And we're living in a living uh, picture right now of all this confusion, of all this garbage that's going on. But we have got to settle in our heart that we're going to not quit. We're not going to give up. We're not going to be ruled by fear. We're not. Amen? And, and, and listen, I, I hate anonymous letters. You guys know that. Because to me, an anonymous letter means you're a coward. Because if you weren't a coward, you'd put your name on it. I'm willing to put my name on it. Declaration of Independence, John Hancock, there I am. Amen? I'm not no back, oh, hi, oh, don't let, I don't want you to find out who I am, but, ah, you're, you're, a, you're a wuss, amen? And maybe you're not supposed to say that as a preacher, but where I come from in Jersey, that's what you are, amen? You're a man that wears a skirt, and not a kilt, a skirt. How's them nylons doing you? If you're afraid to tell the truth, that's what you are, Amen? And we have got to stand up. And so anyway, so I got, so, so you get these anonymous letters. Well, I got one the other day from uh, Springfield, Missouri, about how this pastor had come to the realization that he needed to take an ad out in the paper to apologize, to apologize to the community. Apologize for what? For standing on the truth? For calling out sin? for saying what was right and what was wrong according to the book. I never apologize for that. Amen? Amen. And if you're offended, then change your ways. But you're not going to change my God or my book. Amen? And so here's that weasel nut. That's just one of a a number of these anonymous things that that get sent. But those people are gutless. They're maggots. And they need to just come out of hiding. You know? So you can say... Pastor, tell us how you really feel. I, re- I really do feel strong about this. There's nothing that, uh, that irks me more than that. You know, I just don't like it. I don't like it at all. All right, but, but what about this fear? It's fear that keeps people from doing what they're supposed to do. And it's this fear of death. If you have a fear of death, then you'll never be good for the kingdom of God because that will always keep you from doing what you need to do. I remember seeing a documentary about World War I, and these two soldiers were talking. The one soldier was known for his bravery, for his willingness to run into battle, his willingness to do what it took to carry out the mission. And the other fella, though he wasn't known for this, in his own heart, he just didn't have that fortitude. He was constantly afraid and he was constantly thinking about how am I going to get back home and survive this. And he had a conversation with this warrior and he said, I don't understand it. How can you do what you do? I can't bring myself to do what you do. How do you do what you do? And he said, because I'm dead already. He said, I don't plan on living and surviving this war. So therefore, I have no fear of death because I'm already dead and there's nothing I can't face and nothing I can't do. I heard that and I said, that's the Christian life. As long as I'm concerned about preserving myself, my own life, then I'm never going to be what God wants me to be. Because you'll never pass out a track. You'll never tell somebody about Christ. You'll never invite them to a service. If you're a preacher or a teacher, you'll never get into anything controversial. You follow what I'm saying here? If there's fear. Now Jesus died to conquer the fear of death. Because He died and rose again, we are not to fear death. So what are some of the reasons, and I'll just hit these real quick, what are some of the reasons that people fear death? Well, well, some of it is fear of the unknown. You never did this before. So you're a little afraid about dying because you don't know what's going to happen. You've never done it before. I've stood along the bedside of some courageous people in our church. Dave, man, Dave Kirkpatrick was facing death courageously. Will de Grace was facing death courageously. Bob Strasbaugh was facing death courageously. 
because they knew that this death was just a doorway. It was a pathway to something better. Amen? And, and, and folks, we, we sometimes are afraid of death because of fear of the unknown. But let the Bible answer your question. Paul was a person who died and he was, he was stoned and, and he died and he went to heaven and he came back. Uh, first, uh, or second Corinthians 12 talks about how he was caught up to the third heaven. But this is what Paul said to the Philippians. In Philippians 1.21, he said, For me to live is Christ. No matter what it costs me to live in this life is, to, is Christ. I will live for Christ. If it means a jail cell, if it means execution, I will live for Christ. But then he goes on and he says this, For me to live is Christ and to die is gain. So if death is gain, even though you may be afraid of the unknown, what's there to be afraid of because it's gain? It's something better than this. Amen? And I have to remind myself, when I get feeling down and, and feeling sad about my daughter not, not being around, and I look at her pictures and I remember when she was here, and, I, and we were so much like each other in so many ways, and and I can hear, hear myself uh, uh, where she would sit on, the, uh, on, I would sit in my chair, she'd be sitting on the couch, and, and we'd like to watch different movies together, and, and we love to watch Abbott and Costello together, you know, who's on first and all that, and man, we would just get a kick out of it, and, and we, would, we would talk about, you know, the movie, and, and I can remember, you know, Pamela's not one to watch a movie and pay attention, but she will ask questions. And I can remember Shanda being like, Mom, if you shut up and watch the movie, you know. But, uh, and you think, and you miss that. Oh, do I miss that? I miss her not being there. But then I think about what does the Bible say? It is gain. It, it is that she is so far better than being here. Amen? Even if she was in perfect health, she is still far better being there than being here. Amen? And so even though death is an unknown, we need not to fear death because death is gain. Death is gain. People are like, how can you have this attitude? Well, if the cancer doesn't turn out in six months from now when they check me again, if I do end up with a multiple myeloma and, and if my time does run short, what are you going to do? What am I going to do? I'm going to praise God, serve God, and when my time is up, I'm going to move on into glory. Amen? That means what, I, what He had for me to do is done. If it's not done, then I stay here. Amen? If it is done, then I check out and I go home. Home, the real home, with the Lord. That's nothing to be afraid of. That's nothing to hide from. It's something as Christians that we need to embrace. And could you imagine uh, the difference it could make in hospitals if more and more nurses Heard people in their deathbeds talking about the glories of heaven. And that at any moment now, I am going to step out of this earth suit into glory and how spectacular that will be. That will start having an effect on some people. Amen? Sometimes I think, well, what could we do to kind of help us with this unknown of the fear of death? And I come up with seven different things. I'll just hit these real quick. Quick. And what I would encourage you is uh, just take a couple of minutes every day. A couple of if a fear of death is in the back of your mind, do this for a couple of minutes every day. Number one, think about seeing Jesus face to face, because that's what's going to happen when you die. You are going to see face to face your Lord and Savior. Amen. Think about this: no more tears, sickness, or sin. Think about this, a new glorified body. Seeing loved ones and friends who have gone on already. Think about walking into them. Think about you enter toward the gates of the city and here comes Bob Straw's boy. Here comes Dave Kirkpatrick. And they're greeting you on that celestial shore. Amen? Think about these people. People who you never met before. Amen? You've never met before. Can you imagine meeting someone in heaven and you say, oh, but well, when did, when did you live? Oh, that was during the revolution. Did you have part in that? 
Think about it. You're going to meet people that were living then that are dying. You're going to get to meet people like Jonah that can tell you about what it was like to be in the whale's belly. You're going to meet Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, Isaiah, and Jeremiah, Peter, and Paul, and James. And what stories they'll have to tell. And they can talk to us about their emotions when they're about to be headed. Or Peter being crucified upside down. Peter, what was going through your mind at that time? And they can share their story. And I guarantee you the story is going to be similar. They're going to say, the grace of God came over me so much. As there is a thing called death grace, dying grace. The grace that God gives you at the moment of death. He's not going to give it to you until you are at that moment. Once you're at that moment, that grace will flood your heart and you'll be able to do what you need to do, amen, to move on to glory. So we'll be able to see people we've never met before. I want you to think about the colors, the smells, the sights, the sounds of what heaven may be like. I remember, and I've told you this story many times before, uh, Gladys Ziegler, a woman who came to our church here, and I'm very skeptical, skeptical and cautious about people's near-death experiences, but I know her and I believe her, amen? And I seen her, the first, I went to the hospital to see her, she had heart surgery, and she died on the table and came back. And I, I went to the hospital to see her, and she was sitting at the end of her bed, and her first words to me wasn't, Pastor, how are you doing? Her first words to me was, Pastor, I died and saw heaven. I said, really? What happened? And she said, well, I didn't see Jesus, but I saw heaven. She said, the colors were bright. She said, it, it, it was a feeling of love. In the atmosphere, you just overall feeling of love. But she said, she couldn't forget about the brightness of the colors. I mean, it really struck her of the brightness of the colors in heaven. So I thought, well, you know, maybe, maybe that was just anesthesia and being in the operating room and whatnot. About several years go by, and I never forgot that story. And so I said, hey, Gladys, remember that time when you died in surgery? Can you tell me about it? And word for word. She told me about it because she didn't forget it. Amen. So that's one of the few stories that I believe. And I'm like, absolutely incredible. But we need to think. We need to consider. Uh, if you're a fear of dying, if you're a fear of this unknown of going to heaven, think of the colors, the smells, the sights, the sounds. Think about what your mansion is going to look like. Jesus says, I go and to prepare a place for you. And if, and if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again to receive you unto myself, that where I am there you may be also. He says that he, he, He's going to build us a mansion, a place up there in heaven, amen, that He's working on it now. The master carpenter, Jesus himself, the one who spoke everything that is into existence, is working on a place for you and for me, amen? Customized for us, ready to move in. Think about that, right? Think about that. Now, living in a double wide mobile home, I'm praise God, I got a place to live, it's not that bad. But I'm thinking there ain't no way that that mansion is going to look like this. Amen? It's going to be glorious and fit to my liking because he knows everything that I like. He knows everything that you like. So what's there to be afraid about death? The unknown. Another reason, and I won't get into these because we're already past a lot, but I just want to mention these and maybe sometime in the future I'll preach more in depth on it. But another reason why Christians have a fear of death is because they're clinging to the things of this world. Their tent pegs are down too far in this life. And yet the Bible tells us to love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. Amen? 
And, and he tells us that in, in 1 John 2, 15 through 17. You can write that down and look it up. But this is a reason why people don't want to die and go to heaven because they uh, love this world. Amen? Do you know why people are so upset about why things are going haywire in our, in our creation, in our country? It's because they love the things of this world. And they love what our country was providing for them. And now that that may all be being taken away, now they're all kind of concerned. Well, see, your problem is you're loving the wrong thing. Amen? If you love Jesus and you love God, and you despise the things of this world, then they can come and take everything that you own, and that will be all right with you. Amen? That will be all right with you. But you have got to be willing to die to the things of this world. Amen? And if you're not, you'll be afraid to die a physical death. Another reason why some Christians are afraid to die is because of regret, regret over time that we have squandered. I mean, Romans 14 talks about that we uh, will all give an account of ourselves. Uh, 1 Corinthians 3 talks about the fact that we're going to uh, have all our works tried by fire. Amen? Uh, and then whatever is burns up, that's a lost reward. But whatever lasts, that's a crown. That's a reward that we'll get and have. But so many Christians, they know that they've squandered so much time. Uh, 2 Corinthians 5.10 says, For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ. And we have to give an account of ourselves, whether it's good or bad. And that word bad means worthless. Amen? What are you giving your life to? If you're giving your life to stuff that is worthless, don't, don't expect much. Now there's some Christians that are honest. And they say, well, man... I know that I'm squandering time and I know that I'm in trouble at the judgment seat of Christ. And they feel that conviction. Others lie to themselves and they have preachers that are willing to lie to them to help them lie to themselves. And those preachers will say, oh, don't worry about it. The judgment seat of Christ is a sports banquet and we all get an award. Yeah, I wish it was that easy. Except for Paul said, knowing the terror of the Lord, we persuade men. You say, but pastor, what do I do now? I know I've squandered time. I know I will stand before the judgment seat of Christ. But what now? I said, this is what you do now. Now you let the past be the past. And from this day forward, you live for Christ. You may have had regrets here, but that's it. No more regrets. Now you're living for Him. Amen? That's the way you take care of that problem. Don't stew about what's already done, it's done. Don't cry over spilt milk, right? The horse is out of the barn, it's too late. All right? But it's never too late to turn your ship around and start living without regrets. And then a final thing, a final thing is not sure of salvation. There's a lot of Christians that are afraid of death because they're not sure of salvation. And part of the reason that they're not sure of salvation is because of shoddy theology and poor preaching. All right, I'll repeat that again for any preachers. Listen to me. reason why people in your church fear death and are not sure of their salvation is shoddy theology and poor preaching. Lordship salvation is shoddy theology at best. It comes out of the Reformation movement and uh, it has nothing to do with biblical Christianity. Amen? There's people that will go to events like, a, like the prayer advance or, or a revival meeting, and they'll hear a, a, a real hot and heavy message, and they'll assume, well, I didn't do this or that, then therefore I must have never been saved. Your salvation is never based on what you did this or that. Pamela was telling me last night or this morning, I think it was last night, she said, well, you, well, Bob, some people say, well, there's no fruit in their life, and if you, you, you don't see their fruits, that means they're not saved. And I said, no, hold on, Pamela. Let's put that verse in its context. In Matthew chapter 7, when Jesus said, by their fruits you shall know them, he was talking about false prophets. You know false prophets by their fruits, amen? A person is saved by what he believes. Paul said, Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. Amen? 
and people try to add to it and they try to blur the lines between justification and sanctification. Sanctification is that process after salvation where you're being made holy and you're growing in grace. Things can short circuit that process, but you're not, it doesn't mean you lost your salvation, you're still saved. Justification is the moment that you're declared righteous by God because you believe in the death, burial, and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And you say, God have mercy upon me, a sinner, forgive me. And he does it just like that. And he gives you the Holy Spirit. Now you might not always live like you're justified because Lot didn't. But you're saved by what you believe, not by what you do. Ephesians 2, 8 and 9 tells us this. For by grace, grace is unmerited favor. So unmerited favor means it's a favor that you cannot earn. It's unmerited. It's grace. For by grace are you saved through faith. Faith, belief, and trust are all linked together. Amen? Faith, belief, trust. Trust. It's all linked together. That's what it is to believe. It's to believe is to trust. Trust what Jesus did is enough. Trust what He said is true. Believe it is true. Amen? That's all it is. It's faith. I trust it. I believe it. Amen? He says, for you're saved by grace through faith, and that not of yourselves. But yet, when they want to determine whether or not a person is genuinely saved, they look at what they do. But yet, it says it's not of yourselves. It is the gift of God. And if it's a gift, it is not something you work for. If I say, Jimmy, I will give you this beautiful hymnal right here, and it's yours free. If you just live right the next ten weeks. It's no longer a gift if he just lives right the next ten weeks. He's earning this. I just thought of something else while I was telling you this illustration. How many times do these TV ministries say, oh, give you this hymnal for a gift of $12? That's not a gift no more, amen? And I like the other, the other advertisement. For any amount, I like to say, how about three cents? Will you accept my gift of three cents and still give me the tapes? No, because they're about making money, Amen. Listen, I want to tell you something. The Bible says, for by grace are you saved through faith, and that it's not of yourself, it is a gift of God. Not of works. Not of works, lest any man should boast. And you would boast. If you could save yourself, you would boast. I lived a good life. I'm in heaven. And even these people uh, that preach this, you can lose your salvation garbage. Even though, oh, how am I in heaven? I didn't lose my salvation because I was a pretty good guy. No, you didn't lose your salvation because you were kept by the power of God. That's what the Bible says, right? That's what the Bible says. And any Pentecostal preachers out there that you believe you can lose your salvation, well, I got a word for you. You better, get, better get, start getting on that congregation about living right because if you believe you can lose your salvation, you got people in your pews dying and going to hell if what you're saying is true, and you are doing nothing about it but comforting them in their sin, allowing them to wallow in their sin, and then perish and go to hell because you believe they lost their salvation. Then you, mister, should have been preaching the gospel to them the way that you see it. Now you say, Pastor, why are you so hot? I'm hot because of all this hypocritical garbage that is going on and people holding theologies that they don't live up to. Now listen, the truth is you cannot lose your salvation and thank God because every one of us in this room would have lost our salvation. We would have lost it. You are saved by grace through faith. Now the result of justification of being saved is what? For we are His workmanship created in Christ Jesus unto good works, which God hath before ordained that we should walk in them. In other words, God has predetermined that we should live godly life, that we should produce good works. But that's not to get saved, amen? That's not to keep saved. That's because we have been justified. And there's all I can do is a heart of love and gratitude because of what God has done, serve Him. He said, but what about if people don't? Well, if people don't, it's between them and God. And 
newsflash, they will have no rewards. They'll be saved, yet so as by fire. No rewards. Still in heaven. Why are some people afraid to die? Not sure of their salvation. John 3.16, For God so loved the world, He did something. He gave His only begotten Son. That's the cross. That whosoever believeth, only nothing else, right? Whosoever believeth on Him should not perish, but have eternal life. They say anything about how you're living, and I'm not advocating living a sinful life. That's not what I'm advocating. I'm advocating of keeping the gospel pure and letting the Holy Spirit transform us instead of us trying to transform ourselves. Amen? Why people are afraid to die. Fear of the unknown. Clinging to the things of this world. Regret, regret over time we have squandered and not sure of your salvation. Every one of those things can be taken care of right here this morning. Right here this morning. In other words, start getting heaven focused and you won't be afraid of the unknown. Stop clinging to this world and you won't be afraid to die. Amen? You won't be afraid to get the virus and die either. Amen? Regret over time you have squandered? Forget about what has passed. Reaching forward to what's forward. Start now living without regret. Start now living for God's glory. And don't worry about what was. That's gone. That's over. Don't worry about it. And not sure of your salvation? As all you got to do is understand it's all of Him and none of me. If your belief, your faith, your trust is in Jesus Christ, the death, burial, and the resurrection, and you say, God, for whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. God, to call is to pray. God, forgive me. My hope, my trust is in you. I believe in what you did. You did it for me. And you've got that forgiveness. Amen? You got it. Now, if you're here this morning and you've never had that moment, you just assume that you're saved, then you need to make sure of it. You need to put your hope, your trust in Jesus Christ. Amen? And so we're going to have a word of prayer. And then Jeremy's going to come and lead us in a hymn of invitation. Said he's going to play. And if God has spoken to your heart about something and you need to move, you need to respond, then please do so at this time. And Lord, I just pray, Father, that you would move across this congregation. I really believe in my heart that one of the hindrances to us fully serving you 100% all out is phobias, is fears of things, dear God. And a big one is this fear of death. As long as I'm afraid to die, then there's always going to be something the devil can hold over me, whether it's a virus, whether it's a legal action, whether it's persecution. But God, take us past that fear. You died so that we wouldn't have to be fear death, that we would be delivered from that fear. So whoever has fear this morning, God, I pray that you touch their heart and release them of that fear even at this moment. I pray, God, for anybody here that does not know you as Lord and Savior, that you'd open their eyes to understand the truth, to believe and to embrace you, Lord, as Savior. Oh, God, we thank you that you're an awesome and a mighty God. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. All right, Jeremy, if you come and lead us in the hymn of invitation, Cindy will play. Let's all stand as we sing hymn number 260. 260. Is my name written there?